Resurrection Sunday. Hope you're ready to celebrate together the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. If you please join me in standing together as we sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. Today we can celebrate his resurrection and know that the what he accomplished on the cross was proven as he came out of the grave. And Lord, I'm thankful that we can worship you because of that. And Lord, I just pray that you'll help us this morning, that we will uh, exalt your name, that we'll proclaim who you are, or that we will uh, realize that we are a people that have hope above any others. Lord, and I just pray that you help us to be thankful for all that Christ has done. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Go ahead and take a few moments and greet each other this morning.
our service this morning. And I know many of you here may be here visiting with family, and it's good to see some familiar faces. But if you're here with us for the first time, uh, we would just like to give you some information about our church. And then after the service, if you'll just uh, come to our hospitality table, we, will, we have a gift that we'd like to give you. And uh, so if you're here with us for the first time, if you just slip up your hand, not at one of the people, men coming by, they would be glad to give you that gift. Um, otherwise, we're thankful to have all of you with us here this morning, and uh, we're glad that you could be a part of our service. And uh, I want to give a few announcements as, as we begin our service this morning. First of all, uh, don't forget, those of you that are involved in Sunday School, that next week we begin our new uh, Sunday School electives. And uh, so look at those in there and, and choose one of those, and uh, I know that you'll enjoy them. I also want to remind uh, those of you that last week, Ken James came up and he gave an announcement that we are going to again uh, be praying for our police officers in Mishawaka and some in South Bend. And uh, if you remember how that works, each of you, if you volunteer, will get a name of a police officer that you pray for throughout uh, this year. If you would like to pray for the same person that you did uh, in the past, uh, just let Ken or Sue know that, either jot them a note or something, and so that they can make sure that you get the same name. Uh, also, we are collecting items to give to our police officers, snack items that we can give to them, and so if you bring those in and put them on the table on the side, we would appreciate that. Uh, remember as well, uh, for young people, uh, we are registering for camp right now. Uh, parents, we need to get the registration in soon. Um, and just so you're aware, I didn't mention this last week, but the, the church will be covering part of that. Um, and uh, see me about that. Uh, and we can give you some details about that. But you see the dates in there as well. You can go to the, the camp's website and register. I encourage you to do that. And when you do, uh, please let me know so we can prepare for that. I'm going to ask our men to come forward for our morning worship offering. And uh, as they're coming, let's pray. God, we do thank you that uh, we can give to you. We're thankful for uh, the blessings we have of worshiping you through just this portion of, of what you have blessed us with. And Lord, I pray that you help us to give uh, in a way that pleases you. And Lord, then I ask that you take what is given and use it in a way that glorifies your name. Lord, give us wisdom as we decide how your monies are used. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for my 
and standing together. The scriptures say this, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. We're going to sing together a song of joyous celebration in the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.
Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testify about God that He raised Christ, whom we did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Let's sing together. Mercy truth.
few moments now, just a couple of minutes, to pray between you and God and ask Him to work in your heart before the Word of God is preached in just a few moments. Father, we trust this morning that your word is true when it says that Jesus Christ was crucified in our behalf, that he was risen. And as he has risen, those who have their faith in Jesus and Jesus alone are also risen. And death could not hold back Christ. So those who have their faith in Jesus will never experience the second death. Death does not have its sting because it does not create separation from God for those who are in Christ. It creates union with God forever and ever. So, Father, we celebrate this morning. Because Jesus is raised, so we are raised. Help us as we come to your word in a few moments as our pastor comes and preaches your word, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you open up our hearts and help us to receive your truth so that we might be changed by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're able, would you please join us in standing one more time as we sing our final song. Behold our God.
you're seeing this morning, you may be seated. Take your Bibles and turn to the scripture that we just read a few moments ago, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. A couple weeks ago, my uh, family and I went out of town. Some of you remember that. We were out of town on Sunday and we went to uh, visit a church. Uh, not That's not why we were out of town, but while we were out of town, we went to a church in Chicago, a large church, uh, historic church in Chicago. And uh, during the songs, we were we were sitting up in the balcony, and there was a there was an individual kind of in the middle of the the auditorium that was really into the music. I mean, he was really into it. I mean, he was just moving all over the place while we were singing, and he was worshiping God. And I know that uh, we are Baptists, and so we struggle to I mean, we stand like a statue. And we struggle to do that, but I don't know how you could sing the songs this morning about about our risen Savior without having some emotion. And uh, so I hope that you know God moved in your heart even as we sang those songs. First Corinthians chapter 15, and uh, as I said, we're going to look at the passage that we read just a few moments ago. And I want to ask by starting off with a very simple question: What difference? Does the resurrection make? Let's pray. God, we are thankful that we can look at this passage this morning. And Lord, I pray you help us to be so grateful to you for what Jesus Christ did for us. And help us to understand, is this resurrection so important? And if so, why? Thank you for this text. We ask, I ask, Lord, that you help me as I preach it, that, that I'll be empowered by your Holy Spirit. Lord, that I will be able to humbly preach the Word of God. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Again, I want to ask you the same question. What difference does the resurrection make? It's a well-known fact that even from the very beginning, there was those who doubted the resurrection. Even, even as it happened, if you remember, on the, on the day Christ res- rose from the dead, the chief priests heard about it. They heard that the tomb was empty. And so they called the men who had been guarding the tomb, and they offered them money. And they offered them money for this purpose, to say, hey, when people ask you, say that the disciples stole his body. We hear about conspiracy theories. That was the original resurrection conspiracy theory. But it wasn't the last. For years that passed, decades and generations and centuries came and went. And and every time across the nation, the ultimate point of attack against Christianity has always been right there at that empty tomb. The resurrection and the truth behind what we call Easter Sunday. See, because Good Friday that we celebrated just a couple of days ago, that doesn't pose any sort of problems for the world because the world understands death. Read the newspaper, turn on the TV, death is forever with us. The funeral homes never go out of business because death is always happening, because we're a death sentence people. Read the obituaries, some of you do. Okay, I don't, but some of you do. You read the obituaries. Here's the crazy thing about the obituaries. They change every day. Because a different person, people die all the time. Every day. And you read about them, mostly as you read the obituary, mostly they're older people. Sometimes they're younger and sometimes they're very young. And no one can claim an exemption from death. The world does not struggle with the notion that 2,000 years ago, in a remote province at the edge of the Roman Empire, a man named Jesus died. They do not struggle with that because death happens to all of us eventually. That Jesus died is no problem for most people. In fact, anyone you talk to and you say, hey, Jesus Christ, and then he died, and they would be like, yep. But the world has an enormous problem with Easter because the world knows nothing about resurrection. 
We have a category for death. We don't have a category for resurrection. If, you, if you're driving down the road and you see a hearse pull out in front of you, you know exactly what that means. You understand what's, a, what's going on. There's, there is a category for that, but there is no category for the dead rising again. Let me ask you the question again. What difference does the resurrection make? What would be different in our world if we found out, listen carefully as I say this, what would be different if we found out uh, that conclusive evidence that Jesus was still dead? Or uh, how about this? What if someone conclusively came out and proved that they discovered the bones of Jesus Christ? What difference would that make? question may sound shocking, and even some of you are thinking blasphemous. But I want to ask it. What if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? Now that's not a new question. I am not throwing something out that, you've, that has never been said before. That question, what if, has been asked for 2,000 years. It's a biblical one. In fact, this passage that we're going to look at in 1 Corinthians, Paul was dealing with that because the people at Paul's time begin, begin asking this question, well, well, maybe there is no resurrection. And Paul goes, wait a second here, let's talk about that. And so it's a, it's a biblical one. In fact, these nine verses that we're going to look at, seven times in those nine verses, Paul asks a simple question or uses a simple word, if. Because he's raising the question about the contrary assumption in order to show us how much rests on the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul's doing what I think some of you understand. Paul's playing the devil's advocate. He's kind of he's he's trying to teach what matters most, and so he's he's not playing some sort of parlor game or trying to waste our time debating trivial matters. He we, we need to remember that an incredible miracle lies at the heart of our faith. We believe something absolutely incredible that a man came back to life. Again, that's not something that we can comprehend. Some of you have heard this story since the day you were born, and so for you, it's, it's become ho-hum. But think about that for a moment. It's a remarkable thing to say. Sometimes we forget how amazing that is, that we believe that a God raised someone from the dead. Since 2013, I have been performing the funerals involved in this church. And so <laughs> since 2013, I have performed not just people in this church. Sometimes I get asked to do funerals of people that aren't in this church. And so since 2013, I've done 30 funerals. I've been involved in burials at cemeteries. I've gone with a family and gone there. I've been involved in processionals where I've been in the lead car with, with someone from the funeral home and we're driving to the cemetery and, and we watch as, as the body is, is laid into the ground. And I've done that 30 times. Not once did I see a resurrection. What are the chances that a man who has been tortured has been brutally beaten and then crucified and just his body is in shreds and then he's buried in a tomb and then three days later he rises again. The odds are against it. In fact, it's never happened since. So when we come to this question, we need to be calm and clear-headed as we read it. It's as if... For just a moment, Paul says, let's do this. Let's leave the church. Let's leave our church lingo behind. Let's go and, and be in a distance and look, and, and look at this and ask this question. What if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? What if? What if Easter isn't really true? What if? Paul answers that question by showing us Four disastrous consequences if Jesus did not rise from the dead. And each one of them deserves our careful attention. So let's look at those four this morning. First of all, 
If there is no resurrection, our, our preaching is without purpose. Look at the passage that we read, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and look at verse 14. It says, And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testify about God that he, is ra ha ha he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is not true that dead are not raised. If it is true that dead are not raised. I want to focus in on one ver word. In verse 14, it says there, uh, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Some translations use the word useless. The word there means without content. Okay? It's, it means that uh, all that we have learned has come to nothing. All that we have learned is nothing. I thought about it this way as I was thinking through this. I have taken hours and hours of theological training. Okay, I've, I've learned the Bible, I've studied the Bible, I remember taking classes in college, I remember one class I took in college called Kings. Say, so what's that all about? We had to memorize the kings of, of Israel and the kings of Judah in order, along with the prophets that were in order. It took a long time to memorize that, and I remember studying that, and, and we had to, for our final exam, put them in order, and that was, that was a, a lot of work. Just the other day, Pastor Nate and I were talking about this. We, I, both of us remember when we were in college and, and we took Greek so that we could better understand the language that the New Testament was written in. And I remember uh, walking around and, and there was always students around campus holding their Greek vocab cards. And they were constantly going through their vocab and studying it for hours and hours and hours. And then I graduated from college and, and within months... I was a youth pastor at a church in Minnesota, and, and from there I continued to take more classes, and I eventually earned another degree uh, sometime later. And, uh, and I mention this only because no amount of education can compensate if at the heart of what I believe is a gigantic falsehood. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then all the education in the world cannot overcome that fact. All the Christian scholars, all the Christian colleges, all the Christian seminaries, all the millions upon millions upon millions of books that have been written about, about this one book, all of it amounts to nothing. Nada. Zero. Zilch. If Christ has not risen from the dead. And that's what Paul is saying there. He's saying, if Christ has not risen from the dead, then everything that we believe, everything that we say, everything that we, that we tell others about is nothing. String all the degrees you want after your name. Write all the books you want. Preach until you pass out. Build the biggest church in the world. Fill the huge stadiums with crowds. But if that tomb is not empty, you are wasting your time. If Christ is not resurrected, then my life and my ministry has no point. Secondly, we want to notice, if, Christ, if there is no resurrection, our faith is without forgiveness. Look at verse 17. Paul says there, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. That word futile is different from the word that was used about vain. Okay, it's not the same thing. It's not uh, the idea of useless. It's not the idea of nothing. The futile uh, means that which produces no results. In other words, something was done and the results of it were nothing. Uh, it's, it's like saying this. Uh, it's like taking a trip with no destination. It's like uh, having a story with no end. It's like a seed that produces no crop. It's futile. And what he's saying in this passage is if, if Christ has not raised from the dead, if Christ did not resurrect, then your faith is futile. And therefore, if your faith is futile, notice what he says next, there is no forgiveness. Okay, think of it this way. We like to say that Christ died for our sins. Okay, on Good Friday, we talked about what was the purpose of why Jesus hung on the cross. It was because he, he paid the penalty for our sins. But how do we know, here's, here's a question, how do we know that death actually accomplished anything? If Christ had remained in the tomb, we would never be for sure that God has accepted his sacrifice, would we? This would be the greatest misery of all, not to know if our sins are actually forgiven. We think about that. 
during that long weekend, we talked about it this morning in our early service, during that long weekend from Friday when Christ died and Saturday, this just empty day of the Sabbath where nothing uh, seemed happy and seemed pleasant to the day when Jesus rose during that long weekend in Jerusalem. No one in the world could be for certain that Christ's death had truly been sufficient for their salvation. As long as he was in the tomb, it looked as if the devil had won and, and Jesus had lost the great battle. Remember on the cross what Jesus said as he hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. What was finished? See, Christ knew what was going to happen. But no one else fully did. If he does not rise from the dead, then Jesus is finished. The story is over and we're still embedded in our sins. Lost. That's why the resurrection is so important. The resurrection, someone once said, the resurrection is, is God's amen to Jesus. It is finished. Jesus cried out, it is finished. And God said, amen, when he raised his son from the dead. And because he lives forever, we can know, we can know that it, our sins are forgiven. And that's the great issue that Paul had in his mind. He said, are we truly forgiven or not? If Christ has not been raised, then the answer is, if Christ has been raised, excuse me, then the answer is yes. If Christ is still in the tomb, then no, you're not forgiven. The third result we want to look at is if there is no resurrection, our death is without delivery. Look at verse 18 of chapter 15. It says in that passage, Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Paul says that Christians who have died have fallen asleep. We see this other places throughout the New Testament. And oftentimes we think that's a pretty peculiar way of putting it. Let me, let me explain a little bit why that's about. The, the word fall asleep and, uh, is from a Greek word. And that Greek word is where we get the English word cemetery. In the beginning, the cemetery, that word cemetery, the idea of a cemetery in, in the sense that uh, we're talking about here was a distinctly Christian word. Let me explain to you why. It, it, it means a sleeping place. That word cemetery means sleeping place. And it was where the Christians were buried in their sleeping place. Why did they say that? Because when you go to sleep, what, what do you expect to happen? You expect to wake up. And so the idea of the cemetery or the sleeping place was they would go to sleep and eventually they wake up. And so Christians have always believed that one day those who died in Christ will wake up at the great coming day of resurrection. And I think about that every time I'm involved in a funeral, especially if it's a funeral of someone who's, who's older and has lived a long life and, and, and maybe of someone who's very sick and, and their, their death was not a shock. You think about it many times that uh, there, there's definitely a sadness involved with the passing of a loved one. But there's often, I be with family, and there's often this sense of relief. Because they know their loved one is, is, is dead, but yet they're in a better place. And at the resurrection... When Jesus Christ returns, the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first and we will all meet him in the air. And Paul is telling us here, if there is no resurrection of Christ, then there is no delivery from death. What shall we say about their, these, the future of those who die? Is it the end? Will we ever see them again? Paul's answer is very clear. If Christ has not been raised, then death wins. If he is still in the tomb, there is no hope for anyone. This life is all there is. There are people who believe that. I can't imagine that. We believe that because Jesus Christ rose again, that we too will rise again and then we will be in the presence of God forever. The fourth result of this or the catastrophic result if there was no resurrection. If there is no resurrection, our life is without hope. Look at verse 19. He says, if, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. 
For Paul, this is the ultimate argument because he means that if Christ is not raised, then we are just fooling ourselves. If Christ is still in the tomb, then uh, the atheists that say there is no God are right. If Christ is still in the tomb, then the skeptics around the world are right. If Christ is still in the tomb, then there is no foundation for our faith. And then we are nothing but self-deluded fools. If Christ is not raised, then we have no message to preach. If Christ is not raised, then we have no God to hear our prayers. If Christ is not raised, then we are not saved. If Christ is not raised, then really, honestly, what we should do is close down every church and sell our properties. Because if Christ is not raised, then for the last 2,000 years, every Christian has been wrong. And that's what Paul means. Sometimes I've heard well-meaning Christians say say this phrase, talking about the resurrection, well, even if it's not true, it's still better to be a Christian, isn't it? Think of all the things you gain by being a Christian. I mean, even if maybe perhaps Christ didn't rise from the dead, wouldn't it, aren't we still better off? Because we have Jesus. No, we're not. If he is still in the tomb, then you don't have Jesus in your heart. If he is still in the tomb, then you're just playing a religious game. If he's still in the tomb, it's not necessarily better to be a Christian. I understand as I've preached this message that I've put these terms in very serious terms because that's how Paul puts it. Paul doesn't want to play games and neither do I. I don't want to come to the end of my life and discover what I've preached is something that isn't true. I don't want to mislead others into thinking that something is true if it's not. If Christ is still dead, then we deserve the pity of thoughtful men because we've believed a lie. And so we come to the end of, of Paul's ifs. If Christ has not been raised, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is without purpose. Our faith is without forgiveness. Our death is without delivery. Our hope is Our life is without hope. Is there an answer to these questions, though? Look, if you will, the final verse we're going to look at, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. Notice what it says. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Here in Paul's answer, clear as a bell, bright as the sun, Consider how much hangs on those three little words. But in fact. The resurrection of Jesus, and and then because of that, our coming resurrection, and the resurrection of all those who have died in the faith before us and after us, all depends on those three little words. But in fact. We didn't sing it this year, but sometimes we sing the song, Up from the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph over his foes, he arose a victor over a dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to raise. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. And Paul is saying here in this passage, if he did not rise, then we are miserable people. But in fact, Christ did arise. And remember, Apostle Paul was one who, who was able to see the risen Savior. He says in this passage an interesting phrase that sometimes we may not fully understand. He says in verse 20, Christ has been raised from the dead. And then he says this, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. That term first fruits was something that the Jewish people would have understood better than we do. It refers to the first part of the harvest. As a, as a Jewish person, you would, you would harvest your fields and as the crop began to yield its harvest, you would bring in your first fruits and the responsibility was to take the first fruits of the barley harvest or whatever it was and offer it to the Lord. It was a happy day when you offered. It was actually a a great day when they would offer their first fruits of the harvest to the Lord because you know why it was a happy day? Because they knew there was more coming. And so they would come in with this joy of, hey, here it is because they knew something was greater happening. And even so, the resurrection of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago is God's way of saying, one day all my children will rise from the dead and not one of them will be left in the grave. And that's why it says that Jesus was the first fruits. He was the first one that was offered as those 
who had fallen asleep. Every single one of us, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, in the work that he did on the cross, understanding that the fulfillment of it was what he did in the grave, every single one of us will be raised from the dead. Then the Bible describes what we'll be like. As we read scripture, we read that every single one of us will be raised, will be immortal, incorruptible, perfected, completed, glorified, free from sickness, delivered from death, with sin gone for heaven, human forever, human frailty disappeared, eternally endowed, supernaturally restored, made like Christ, all your defects gone, all that is under construction finally completed, healthy bodies, healthy minds, undivided hearts. Revelation tells us it's not just that we'll be raised up, but then we'll join together with all saints from all ages in a multitude that no one can number. And we will gather around the throne of God and we will worship and we will laugh and we will sing and we will praise God. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And for a Christian, this is our hope. This is our faith. This is our confidence. This is the faith of our ancestors who believed before us what we believe now. This is what the earliest Christians believed. I mean, think about this for a moment. Who were those that experienced the, the resurrection, the apostles? And the Bible tells us that those men, those men radically turned the world upside down. How would that be possible except for the fact that they, with first-hand eyes saw the resurrected Lord. As I said in the beginning, all that we see with our eyes seems to argue against the resurrection. It's not something we have a category for. But it does not depend on what we see with our eyes because our eyes only see what is. What they can't see is what will be. One day we will see the future. And God will rise, will raise us from the dead. 2,000 years ago, Jesus came back from the dead, never to die again. He was taken up to heaven. The Bible tells us now he sits at the right hand of the God uh, of God Almighty. And one day he will return to earth as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And in that great day, the dead in Christ will rise first. Let the doubters doubt if they will. Let the skeptics be skeptical if they will. But we know this. We gladly join with Christians everywhere in declaring that Jesus is alive forever. We join with saints who have gone before in proclaiming our faith in the risen Lord. Because he arose, we too shall rise. Death will not be the last word for me. And death will not be the last word for you if you have placed your faith in God grave will not win in the end. Though we do not see it yet, one day, the graveyard will be the resurrection territory. In that day, we will all rejoice together with tears gone forever, and death is a distant memory. What a happy day that will be. As we sang a moment ago, as we talked about this morning, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. God, we are overflowing with joy in the fact that your Son is risen. Lord, so often we get wrapped up in our our world. Lord, we, we, we know you. We know what you have done for us. We know the importance of of Christ's death. We know the importance of Christ's resurrection. But sometimes, God, you know us. You know we're frail humans or selfish humans. Sometimes we forget how incredible that truly is. And God, I hope that your word allowed those here this morning to see the incredible nature of your resurrection. That we as people can stand forgiven. Not just because Jesus died on the cross, but because Jesus proved that dying on the cross was enough to pay for our sins. 
And Lord, in a few moments, we're going we're gonna to have a time we, we observe the Lord's Supper and we remember what Jesus Christ did on the cross. But Lord, as we do that, Lord, help us to also rejoice in his resurrection. God, if there's any here this morning that have not placed their faith in you, have not placed their faith in what the work that Jesus did on the cross, Lord, I pray that you will convict them of their sins because your word tells us that one day those who have not done that will spend e eternity burning in hell. And I know it is not your desire that any should perish. So Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict and will draw them to yourself. Thank you again for your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand as we sing together. There is a redeemer. Christ, you're uh, welcome to participate as well. And uh, we'll sing this verse and then we'll go into our communion. When I stand in Supper was all about. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. God, we are thankful that we can remember what Christ did for us on the cross. Lord, help it to humble us. Help it to encourage us to live more like those who have been forgiven and less like those who are still shrouded by sin. Lord, I pray that you will help us to to exalt your name through this. Lord, we praise you for what you have done. We ask now, Lord, as we 
as we take the time where we um, participate with the, the bread and the cup, that we will remember those elements and how they um, represent what Jesus Christ did. Thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask our men to stand, and we will distribute the bread. said, this is my body which is broken for you. Eat in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask the gentleman to stand and we will distribute the cup.
When Jesus partook of the cup with his disciples, he said to them, I will not do this again with you until the resurrection of the saints. And that resurrection is possible and proven through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So until then, drink in remembrance of Christ. Let's pray. God, we are thankful for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you help us this week to live as people that are covered by the blood of Christ. Not live by people who are captivated by flesh and the life that you saved us out of, but live changed. Lord, we thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, the deacons are going to come around and they will collect the cups and then Pastor Nate will close our service. We can celebrate the fact that he is not in the grave, but he is risen, just as he said. Help us to live as those who have been purchased by his blood, living to tell of the good news of the resurrection. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.